Welcome to FMC Preschool. This is Agriculture 103, Let's Talk Kosha. And for today's class, we have brought in a special professor, Dr. Charles Geddes. More on him in a moment. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nolan Kowalchuk, and I will be moderating the class this morning. For the past six years, I have been the FMC Technical Sales Manager for Alberta and Northern Saskatchewan. Previous to that, I was the initial account manager hired in Alberta to establish the retail business network for FMC. I have held other roles within the agricultural sector, including the farm equipment finance sector and the retail, wholesale, and manufacture areas of the crop protection industry for the past 26 years. Education includes a Bachelor of Arts degree specializing in economics, a Bachelor of Management degree specializing in finance, and a CCSC designation from the University of Saskatchewan. Rachel Evans, my colleague, is the Technical Sales Manager for Manitoba and Seldron, Saskatchewan, a position she has held for the past four years. She brings her strong academic and consulting background in the areas of plant and soil science to help provide solutions for FMC farm customers. She holds a Master of Science in Plant Science from the University of Manitoba, is a certified crop advisor and professional agrologist. Rachel will be moderating the incoming questions during the question portion of our class. So before we get started, I wanted to take a minute to review our mandate and vision of preschool. FMC Preschool is an education and stewardship extension of FMC Canada. We have a firm mandate to educate and bring value to customers and stakeholders regarding proactive weed control and resistance management for best practices. You know, one of the most important takeaways, I guess, from this slide is that our preschool form is product agnostic. You will not see information on products and charts or graphs on today's presentation, but we'll get great agronomic information on the different topics, principles we are presenting upon. You know, I wanted to also take a second and introduce the other FMC preschool faculty members. Jordan Brisbois is our product manager of FMC Preschool and Extended Weed Control. You've met the technical sales managers, myself and Rachel. Dana Singmail is our area manager out of Swift Current, Saskatchewan. Travis Goble, our area manager out of Saskatoon. Brian O'Hara, area manager out of Lethbridge. Katie Phipps, our marketing um, manager with Cantac, our marketing agency. Carmen Lowe Wasserman is our marketing strategies manager, manager, and Krista Henry is our marketing communications manager. So as you can see, we have a variety of different members on this team. There is input from preschool on all aspects of our FMC business. We have members from our marketing, technical sales team, sales staff, and our marketing communications team. The topics that we come up with and the information that we present is being driven literally from the ground up. So today's class is cleverly titled, Let's Talk Kosha. Kosha is one of the most prolific weeds in Western Canada. It's no news that herbicide resistant kosha biotypes have developed rapidly and continue to progress and increase in prevalence across Western Canada. As we have seen this past year, kosha has spread to non-traditional kosha areas, and in order for us to get a handle on it, it does require an integrated approach to management so that we can limit its spread. With that in mind, our faculty thought, who best to educate us further than today's guest speaker, speaker Dr. Charles Geddes? Dr. Charles Geddes is one of Western Canada's foremost researchers on herbicide resistant plants, weed ecology, integrated weed management, examining the dynamics between crops, weeds, the weed seed bank, and more. 
Dr. Geddes is a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Lethbridge, Alberta. He leads the Weed Ecology and Cropping Systems Research Program, which focuses on discovery, monitoring, and management of herbicide-resistant weeds in Western Canada. Charles grew up on a mixed cattle forage grain farm near Pilot Mound, Manitoba. He graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Agroecology and a PhD in plant science from the University of Manitoba. Currently, he leads a diverse range of research, including the prairie herbicide resistant weed surveys, management of herbicide resistant kochia, manipulating weed seed production and return to the soil seed bank and understanding soil seed bank dynamics. So with no further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Charles Geddes. Great, thanks very much. Um, can you please confirm you can see my screen here? Yes, we can. Great, all right. Well, thanks Nolan for that introduction. And uh, thanks also to FMC for the invitation to come and talk about one of my favorite topics, which is kochia. Um, so I lead the Weed Ecology and Cropping Systems Research Program um, based out of Lethbridge, Alberta. And so today I'll, I'll be talking about a few different topics related to kochia. I'll start off with some information on biology and ecology. Then I'll go into herbicide resistance with a specific focus on the Canadian prairies. And then also um, end off the presentation with uh, some, of, some of our results on kochia management. So to start off uh, with kochia biology and ecology, this is kind of the kochia biology in one slide. Um, and so I'll take us through this a little bit. Um, first of all, kochia is, is a, a big problem across the prairies, um, usually in the, in the southern part of the prairies. And that's in part due to herbicide resistance, but there's also several unique characteristics about the biology of kochia that allow it to thrive in, under our growing conditions in the southern prairies. Um, so first of all, kochia is, is usually one of the first weeds to emerge in the spring. In many cases, um, the majority of the kochia population is heart, has already emerged before any other species in that field. Um, the populations are both genetically and phenotypically diverse and plastic. Um, so we, research has shown that kochia populations are as diverse within a single field as they are among fields on one side of the prairies versus another. Um, those populations can produce up to 100,000 seeds per plant in the absence of competition, uh, with typical seed production under competition ranging around that 20 to 30,000 seeds per plant. And those seeds can be di dispersed over a long distance because kochia is a tumbleweed. Um, so in the late fall, kochia plants senesce and, uh, and the, the stem becomes brittle and uh, prevailing winds can break that stem at a, a decision layer. Um, resulting in the transport of, of a tumbleweed um, blowing across fields. The plant also exhibits protogynous flowering, which is where the stigma on, on the plant emerges and is receptive to pollen before the anther um, fully develops on that plant, meaning essentially that kochia has a period of, the, of forced outcrossing um, that's followed up by um, self-pollination. So first of all, that's that's how we see transfer of, of uh, herbicide resistance traits through pollen is because of that period of initial outcrossing followed up by self uh, pollination that allows for reproductive assurance and seed production. In addition, the populations have high seed bank turnover with uh, longevity in the soil seed bank tending to be about one to two years. Um, so that population turns over quite quickly and that aids in rapid evolution of, of resistance to whatever stresses are imposed upon the population. And finally, kochia is tolerant to several different abiotic stressors like heat, drought, and salinity, allowing it to thrive in those areas of the field where the crop is not as competitive. So here's some data on um, the early emergence of kochia. So we're, we're looking at uh, kochia emergence in a couple different fields over time based on cumulative growing degree days. And we always use a base temperature of zero degrees Celsius for kochia because it tends to, um, it has the ability to emerge at very cool temperatures. And so this is just showing that the kochia can typically emerge um, before 100 growing degree days, but um, in some cases, even as early as 50 growing degree days, putting that emergence 
um, in sort of March and April. Um, so it's, it's an early emerging weed, but it also can exhibit prolonged emergence periodicity where it can emerge up to and even after post-emergence herbicide applications. And so that's shown also in this table here from the, from the same study um, where they looked at several different fields. This was in southern Manitoba and looking at the density of kochia that emerged in those fields, but also at different time points here. So we're looking at, first of all, before seeding the crop, you can see that the majority of the kochia population emerged before seeding. Then after, or before herbicide application, this would be the in-crop herbicide application, you, do, you see some of the kochia population emerging. But then also after the post-emergence herbicide application, you see kochia emerging. Um, so the, the big issue here with kochia and prolonged emergence periodicity, it means that it's really difficult to catch the entire kochia population with a single herbicide application. So here's some information from the um, U.S. Great Plains, where um, the, each subfigure here represents a different site year of the research. And uh, what these researchers were looking at was daily emergence of kochia over time. And you can see that um, the kochia populations in general among all of these sites, in many cases, they exhibited either a bimodal or a trimodal effect, which essentially means that kochia populations are emerging in multiple flushes. And these researchers were, were um, able to tie that back to um, precipitation events, meaning that, uh, that rainfall events tend to promote another flush of kochia, um, and in some cases up to two, three, or maybe even four flushes of kochia during the growing season. There's several factors that impact the emergence or germination and emergence of kochia. And uh, I mentioned that, that kochia is, is tolerant of certain abiotic stresses. And um, this, is, this is looking at uh, the interaction of both temperature and salinity on, uh, on the germination rate of kochia. So on the y-axis, we have germination percentage. And on the x, we have time and days. Each subfigure represents a different temperature you can see here. So we're increasing temperature going from left to right, and also on the bottom here. Um, but then within each subfigure, we're also looking at different levels of salinity, zero being um, low salinity, um, a thousand being high salinity. So there's a few things that we can pull out from, from this sort of group of subfigures. First of all, there's an interaction um, between salinity. If you look up here, the, at cooler temperatures, greater salinity um, really limits that cumulative germination of kochia. Another thing to pull out is that at higher temperatures and low salinity, salinity you, you tend to see uh, a more rapid germination of, of kochia seeds, which makes a lot of sense, right? Um, but also any of the, the factors that had higher salinity here, you, you tend to see a prolonged emergence, right? So um, those saline conditions could result in kochia populations um, emerging over a longer period of time, or germinating and emerging over a long period of time, um, meaning that it's, it's potentially more likely that you, you would miss them with any one herbicide application or any one management practice. So Hugh Becky, when, when he was um, a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada out of Saskatoon, um, he conducted a lot of interesting research on kochia biology. And this is just one of the, one of the uh, experiments that they conducted looking at pollen-mediated gene flow. So what they did was they, they set up an experiment that's called a wheel and spoke design. And what they were looking at was pollen flow from a pollen source. Um, so in this case, they used a glyphosate resistant kochia population as a pollen donor. So in the middle of an experiment, they had um, a block of glyphosate resistant kochia plants. And then in this wheel and spoke design, you can see the spokes going out in various directions from the pollen block. And using this, these are all susceptible plants and using the glyphosate resistance trait, they can look at how um, that trait is actually transferred in pollen and over what distances and in which direction. So here's just some data from two different site years um, showing that in general, the pollen flow from kochia and pollen flow of, of the glyphosate resistance trait um, tends to be between sort of that 15 and 20 meters away from, from that pollen source. But in some cases also, if you look further down, um, you can see 
that even up to 95 meters away from that initial population here, um, there was a very small amount of pollen mediated gene flow. We also looked at seed dispersal. Um, so this is some, some research from two site years in Lethbridge. And uh, what they did, a really interesting study where they attract or they attached um, tracking collars to kochia tumbleweeds and allowed them to blow across a field and uh, looked at the amount of seed that's dropped off the tumbleweed um, as based on the speed at which the tumbleweed is traveling, but also the distance that that tumbleweed traveled. So in general, this, there wasn't a huge effect um, based on the speed at which the tumbleweed was traveling necessarily, except at very low speeds. Um, you tend to see a little bit less seed dropped, but also looking at the distance that those tumbleweeds traveled here, showing that over the first kilometer of travel, um, those plants tended to, to lose about 90% of their seed. But also that means that that, that extra 10% um, stays on the plant and is dispersed over distances longer than a kilometer, so likely into neighboring farms or fields. So if you tie that back to the potential for 100,000 seeds per plant, 10% of that traveling beyond the initial field um, can create a, a pretty big issue with uh, transfer of seed among fields. Here we're looking at, uh, at bioclimate modeling of kochia. And so essentially what we're looking at is the suitable range of kochia. So here we're looking at the current climate and um, we're looking at ecoclimactic index, which is essentially a, a, a different scale of suitability for growth and development of kochia. So showing that kochia really thrives in, in these areas here um, as you start seeing darker and darker red. But over here, we also have a grid of maps. And this grid is um, looking at increasing temperatures going from the top to the bottom uh, across the entire map, um, increasing temperatures by one degree Celsius, two degrees Celsius, and three degrees Celsius. And so as you move from the top to the bottom, you start seeing that northern range of kochia on, on the prairies start e er, extending further north. Um, so even here at the two degrees Celsius, you can see that um, kochia is now um, showing or it's, it's quite suitable um, conditions in even up into the Peace River region and even more so at plus three degrees. As you go from left to right, we're looking at a, a gradient of precipitation. So we have 20% uh, extra precipitation here, unchanged precipitation and lower precipitation over here. And so as we see drier and drier conditions, we also see that kosher range start expanding further into Eastern Canada. And so similarly, we can take this information. And so this is the same data here, looking at the range of kosher, um, but also applying over here, a general circulation model for 2070, where we're looking at what the climate might look like in 2070 and what that does to the range of kochia based on its biology and ecology. And by comparing these two maps, you can see, first of all, the range of kochia at current is, is tends to be limited to the southern prairies, um, where we have um, still our northern agricultural extents um, tend to not see as much kochia there. However, um, under the climate change scenario, it's actually those ranges, the, the northern latitudes of agricultural production on the prairies and up into the Peace River region that um, are quite suitable for growth and development of kochia. And so we started to see some of that this year, actually. Um, so here I pulled out four maps. Um, so 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021, just looking at growing degree days with a base temperature of zero degrees Celsius. And I'll point out that the cutoff between the, the lighter green and the darker green is about 2,400 growing degree days. And the, the immediate thing that, that pops out is that this year, we saw that, that um, 2,400 cutoff move a lot further north than it has in the previous three years even um, showing up in, in the Peace River region there. And so that resulted this year um, in several reports of, of kosher showing up further north than it has been observed in the past. And the reason for that, um, here I'm just pulling out some data from our, our work in Lethbridge, looking at the timing of kosher seed production, and I'll get into this a bit more in, in uh, subsequent slides, but uh, 
Here we're looking at kosher seed production based on cumulative growing degree days. This would be with a base temperature of zero as well, trying to determine when does the seed on a kosher plant actually become viable. And so if you look around that 23, 2400 growing degree days, that's really when we start seeing viable seed showing up on a kosher plant. So essentially, kosher reproduction is limited by growing degree days on the prairies. But as we start seeing warmer and warmer temperatures like we have this, this past summer, we start seeing that northern range of kosher moving further and further north. The other thing that, that had an impact on kosher this year, again, temperature, um, but in a different way. So here we're looking at the response of a susceptible kosher population to varying rates of glyphosate in what we call a dose response experiment. And we're looking at visual injury and dry biomass of those kosher plants. The three different curves, so the, the blue is a cooler temperature regime with about 17 and a half degrees Celsius during the day. Green was about 25 during the day. And then the red was 32 and a half during the day. And as you can see, as we're increasing that temperature regime, the amount of glyphosate that's actually needed to control a susceptible kosher plant is increasing, right? So you need a higher rate of glyphosate to control susceptible kosher under, um, under higher temperature. We see the same thing over here as well in, in dry biomass, where you're seeing that curve shift from the left to the right, meaning you need, you're needing higher rates to achieve the same level of control. But also if you look at, at the untreated um, here, you can also see the impact that temperature has on kosher growth and development in general, where under cooler, the cooler regime, you see almost a third of the biomass produced compared with the higher 32 and a half temperature. And so these researchers were able to tie this back to the absorption of glyphosate by kosher plants, where you can see under the higher temperature regime, about half of the glyphosate um, was absorbed compared with the cooler and mid temperature regime. So temperature certainly does interact um, with herbicide efficacy. And so here we're, we're digging a bit further into uh, what would be the untreated in, in those previous examples where we're looking at um, growth of a C3, so wheat, um, cool season, crop um, compared with kosher and Russian thistle, which are both warm season C4 species under three different temperatures. So they had 15 degrees, 23 degrees, and 30 degrees. And so with the wheat, you see greater biomass accumulation here at the cooler temperatures, um, whereas for kosher and Russian thistle, you see sort of that mid and high temperature um, being most favorable for those plants to, to accumulate biomass. And looking over here now, uh, just comparing those species at the different temperatures, under the cooler temperature regime, you see the wheat um, putting on a lot more biomass than kosher and Russian thistle. However, when you're moving into those, um, the mid and high temperature regime, especially at this higher temperature, um, you see kosher and Russian thistle putting on biomass almost like they're unhindered by that warmer temperature, whereas wheat is not doing so well. And um, so this is in part why we saw some of the, or why we observed kosher being such an issue this year. Um, for example, in Lethbridge, we saw um, about 40 or more days with greater than 30 degrees Celsius this year. So Dr. Sean Sharp from um, AAFC in Saskatoon and I recently um, conducted a literature review where we were trying to pull out data from publications on the impact that kosher has on crop yield. And so here is basically a summary of the literature looking at, at the impact of kosher on crop yield losses. And so you can see that there's a range um, in yield observed yield losses, um, which is to be expected. And that tended to depend on the timing of kosher emergence relative to the crop, but also the density uh, at which kosher was present in the crop. But in some of these crops at higher densities, we did see upwards of and greater than 95% yield loss in corn, in sorghum, sugar beet, and sunflower as well. Um, but if you look at the X here, this is the mean among all of the observed values. You can see that it varies quite a bit among crop species, where we tend to see greater yield loss in crops like corn, sorghum, soybean, and sugar beet. 
and then lower in, in some of the other crops that, that are grown on the prairies like canola, field pea, um, oats, wheat, for example. So now moving into herbicide resistance. So the story for resistance in kochia, first of all, group two resistance uh, or, or ALS inhibitor resistance was first documented on the prairies back in 1988. And that was in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, and then the subsequent year also in Alberta. And uh, over the course of a, about two decades, um, we saw group two resistance spread to essentially all kosher populations to the point where um, it's not even worth testing them for resistance anymore. If you are dealing with a kosher population, it's safe to assume that it's group two resistant. Then in, in 2011, the first glyphosate resistant kosher in Canada was, was documented in, uh, in fields that had, had received uh, recurrent applications of glyphosate in chemical fallow. And the subsequent survey in 2012 documented that about 4% of the, the populations tested in Alberta were glyphosate resistant. Then this survey was repeated five years later and we saw glyphosate resistance in kosher increase from about 4% of the populations to 50% of the populations in 2017. So resistance is increasing rapidly among these populations, similar to what was observed for group two resistance as well. In addition, um, so all of these populations were group two resistant and 18% shown in the blue and green were dicamba resistant, which is a synthetic auxin herbicide. Uh, mainly used in, in our systems in small grain cereal crops. Um, and so 10% of these populations overall were resistant to group twos, fours, and nines. And so we, we actually just recently um, sampled the Southern Alberta again this, this past growing season in October. And uh, and so we're processing those samples and uh, are about to start the resistance diagnostics. So we should see um, an updated um, survey here coming out in the not too distant future. Some of our other work has returned back to the um, 2017 survey of Alberta. And what we wanted to know was we're seeing dicamba resistance showing up in Alberta, um, but are those dicamba resistant populations also cross resistant to other synthetic auxins like furoxpyr, which is commonly used in our crop production systems? And so we did find that furoxpyr resistance was present in southern Alberta in about 13% of the populations. And here we're looking at the frequency of resistance to furoxpyr. If you think, Think of a, a COVID positivity rate. Um, this is showing the same thing for fluoroxypyr resistance, where we're, we're um, showing that the, the positivity rate for fluoroxypyr resistance in kosher tends to be greater in this Highway 2 corridor between Lethbridge and Calgary. And so here, we're just looking at the response of three different kosher populations to varying rates of dicamba and fluoroxypyr. And so field rates um, in general are for furoxpyr are sort of 70 to 140 and about 140 to 280 for, for dicamba um, in our production systems. And uh, you can see that these populations certainly do vary in response to these two different synthetic auxin herbicides. And so this is showing the same thing, but across several different um, kosher populations, we're looking at, these two are looking at the biomass response to dicamba in fresh weight and dry weight. And then over here, the same thing to furoxpyr. And you can see that we're seeing this variable um, resistance to these two different synthetic auxin herbicides. And over here, looking across all samples in that 2017 survey, I mentioned about 18 to 19% were dicamba resistant. 13% were furoxpyr resistant, but actually only 4% of the populations overlapped where they had both dicamba and furoxpyr resistance, which means if you do have synthetic auxin resistance, it is quite possible that you have resistance to one synthetic auxin, but the other still remains effective, which can be a, a short-term um, management practice anyway. And we're seeing similar results in Manitoba as well. Um, so the story in Manitoba back in 2013, the first cases of glyphosate resistance were documented, shown by the asterisks on the map here. And uh, unlike Alberta, these two populations were first documented in glyphosate resistant crops, corn and soybean. And uh, we repeated that survey then 
five years later and documented an increase in glyphosate resistance from 1% to now 58% of the populations in Manitoba in 2018. And most of the resistance is showing up um, at a higher frequency anyway in these southern rural municipalities in Manitoba. And four populations were documented with dicamba resistance. Um, this was a low level resistance, so it's indicating that resistance is building within these populations, um, or was in 2018, and it was likely to be an issue here in the near future. So moving into kosher management now. So some of our, our work on management is looking at managing kosher throughout crop rotations, in addition to developing management strategies based on the biology and ecology of kosher. So here we're looking at, first of all, a herbicide layering approach, but then integrating layering with cultural management, which I'll get into in a second. The crop rotation that we're interested in is a wheat, canola, wheat, lentil crop rotation. And I'm just laying out the different modes of action that we're using at various time points throughout that rotation. Um, so to just take you through this, um, first of all, I'll mention that in our in-crop herbicides, we aimed to, to limit um, the use of synthetic auxins in this experiment because we um, were aware that, that uh, dicamba resistance was just documented when we designed this experiment. So to start off um, with glyphosate and carfentrazone before wheat, as a pre-plant, and then in the wheat crop, um, pyrosulfatol and bromoxynil, um, bo both of these herbicides have activity on kochia. Um, then in the fall, we moved into ethyl fluorolin applied, and uh, then we just used glyphosate pre-plant in the canola, but it was Liberty Link canola, so we were using glufosinate, which is also quite effective on, on kochia. Back to the wheat, we have glyphosate and carfentrazone, um, and then um, MCPA and bromoxynil in crop. And that led us into um, the lentil, where we had a, a group 14, so safrufenicil, a 15 pyroxysulfone plus glyphosate, which provided a little bit of residual control going into the lentil crop because there are essentially no post emergence herbicide options available for um, control of group two resistant kochia in lentil. And we know that all kochia is essentially group two resistant. So we integrated that sort of a, a layering approach with different cultural management as well. And what we were interested in was throughout the rotation, looking at row spacing. So we had a wide row spacing versus a narrow row spacing and a recommended um, seeding rates versus double the recommended seeding rates. And here I'm just showing the two most contrasting systems with wide and recommended densities up here and narrow row spacing and double the recommended densities on the bottom. And throughout the entire rotation. And so what we're trying to do here is promote a competitive um, crop rotation and uh, and kosher tends to respond quite well to to or, or tends to respond to to crop competition and how it responds is it actually reduces the amount of seed that a plant produces. So what we're trying to do is deplete the kosher seed bank going into the less competitive crop where there's no post emergence herbicide applications. Um, lentil here. And you can see there is a bit of a visual difference here, just looking at the same herbicides throughout, but adding that other component of promoting a competitive crop. And so digging into some of the data uh, from this experiment, here I have data from the first three years of the experiment. And uh, the rotation was fully phased, which means that every crop or every phase within that rotation was present every year. And so we have the Wheat, canola, wheat, lentil rotation at the recommended density versus double the recommended density and using the wide row spacing versus the narrow row spacing. Um, and here our response variable that we're looking at is kosher biomass. And so there wasn't an interaction among all of these factors in this rotational study. Um, but if you focus more in on the um, competitive rotation, so the narrow rows, higher densities, you see that there is overall much less kosher biomass um, when you're promoting that competitive rotation, even in, in the crop where you don't have an effective herbicide um, applied post-emergence. So digging in a bit further now, um, we had a crop rotation phase by year interaction where we tended to see more biomass in the lentil crop which makes a lot of sense. 
but also looking at uh, at the crop seeding rate here, so recommended versus double recommended seeding rates among all of the crops. We did see an effect in 2020, which was the year where we actually did receive a decent amount of precipitation in Lethbridge. And so increasing that um, seeding rate actually decreased kosher biomass by 74% in that year. For row spacing, however, um, we saw a main effect among all of the crop rotation phases and all of the years um, that we studied where decreasing that row spacing uh, resulted in a decrease in kosher biomass by 60% among all of the crops and years. So it's almost like the adding in this cultural management is essentially like adding another herbicide to the tank. Here's some of our other research that focused in a bit more on the uh, on the integration of cultural with chemical management. Um, so we're looking at three different kosher populations in the sub figures here. And this was a known susceptible population, and this was a known resistant population, and then this one was kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, and we're looking at, at the a dose response to varying rates of feroxapyr, um, but within subfigures, you see these different lines are adding in um, wheat into that dose response as well at different densities. So you can see across the, the dose response, we're adding in higher and higher rates of wheat, which is pushing that kosher biomass, even of the resistant population, lower and lower. Um, so we're seeing a bit of an interaction between um, chemical management and seeding rates um, in order to help manage these resistant populations. And so here we're pulling out data from, from what I had, um, from a similar, um, similar figure to what I had just showed you there, um, but we're focusing on kosher survival and visible control. And we're pulling out what's the, the LD50, or which is a lethal dose, um, meaning a dose that's required to cause 50% plant mortality for kosher. And also the ED50 um, for a visible control, which is the dose required to cause 50% visible control of the kosher population. And along the x-axis here, we have different wheat densities, so increasing density as we move to the right. Uh, and what, what I was wanting to show here is that, especially for this resistant population shown in red, as we're increasing wheat density, the amount of fluoroxypyr that's required to control that resistant population is declining, um, where um, you're seeing this interaction between a competitive environment and um, even the herbicide to which that population is considered resistant. So seeding rates combined with herbicide management can help um, reduce the, uh, the potential for, for resistance in, in kosher. Some of our other work is looking at crop rotation diversity as well. And we're looking at several different crop rotations, but here I'm just pulling out that same example of spring wheat, canola, spring wheat, lentil um, in the middle here. But then on the bottom, we're actually swapping out the spring wheat for winter wheat. And uh, our goal here is that winter wheat being a winter annual is already established in the spring. It, uh, so it can be um, competitive with kosher that's just trying to emerge. Uh, but then also we, uh, winter wheat is harvested a little bit earlier and we can try and harvest the winter wheat crop before kosher produces viable seed. So we're cutting off those kosher plants before they're, they're actually producing seed. The idea again is to deplete the seed bank before we go into lentil where there's no post-emergence herbicide option. And you can see a visible difference here between the two. Um, and we're observing this um, in, in, throughout the field experiment. Similar, um, we, we also looked at adding a perennial into the rotation. And so um, this year we were going into the third year of this perennial establishment. And so the first two years, the kosher was, was pretty dense in those plots, um, but we continued to, to cut those plots for forage. And this third year now that the, the, the perennial has really caught on, um, we actually, I, I could hardly even find a kosher plant present in, in those plots. So Farming Smarter is taking some of our results uh, and some of our some of kosher management practices and bringing them out to the field and trying to implement them in a patch management approach. So I mentioned that, that kosher likes to thrive in those patches um, in some cases that, that um, have a bit more salinity. 
Um, but also kochia is, uh, it's an indeterminate plant, meaning that it will continue to grow. Um, it will continue to grow and stay nice and green as long as those conditions are there for it to grow. So you often end up with something like this around harvest time where your crop is a nest, but you have these nice green kochia plants, which uh, can create issues with harvest, but it can also create opportunities when it comes to mapping kochia populations as well. Um, so what they're doing in this project is um, basically in the fall, um, they're, they're looking at, at um, taking imagery of the field. And this is just a green threshold to threshold the kochia plants. And you can see that in this particular field, there was a, a, a bit more saline area here where kochia really was, was um, the worst problem. And uh, it tended to be from these patches where kochia was moving out into the rest of the field. So they used this, this threshold in the fall after spring wheat to come up with a prescription for the next spring. And the next spring in 2020, the field went into faba beans. Uh, and so for their herbicide approach here, they, they applied ethylfluorylin blanket across the entire field, but only in that patch that they, they had identified using the imagery, um, they applied sulfentrazone, um, which, which um, tends to have a bit better efficacy on kochia. And uh, you can see in the fall of the faba beans, it actually did seem to help um, clear up that kochia population to a certain extent anyway. So continuing along the lines of patch management here. Um, so you, often uh, I mentioned kochia being a problem around harvest time because it, the green plants can, can plug up combines, uh, but also a combine can spread kochia seed as well, right? So, you tend to see um, these dense kosher patches that are harvested around um, and then the, the farmer coming in later to, to figure out how to manage those kosher patches. The issue, um, so, so many farmers know that, that kosher um, has been used in the past as a forage source for, for livestock feed. And, uh, but we don't really know when, when kosher seed becomes viable on the plant. So we're trying to answer a few questions about seed viability and the timing of seed viability. So first of all, how late can kosher emerge and still produce viable seed before the end of the year? And also when do those seeds become viable? So to start off with the first question here, we're looking at kosher seed production on the y-axis here and then um, cumulative growing degree days on the x. And this is basically growing degrees at the time that kosher emerged. So here would be kosher emergence in the early spring this would be later in, into um, late summer. And you can see earlier emer emerging kosher plants produce more seed, and, but as they emerge later and later, they have less seed production potential. To tie this back to calendar dates though, um, you can see kosher plants even emerging up to early to mid-August can still produce a small amount of viable seed um, in Western Canada, or in this case, these data are coming from Lethbridge. A similar experiment is looking at the timing of seed production. And I showed this graph previously in the presentation where we're looking at when does the seed actually become viable on kosher plants. And if you transfer these same dates over here, you can see it's roughly um, seed production starts in September and increases quite rapidly throughout the month of September and into October. We're taking this though a bit further and overlapping these two curves for seed production and we can determine when during the growing season um, does it make sense to come in and manage those kosher patches and, uh, and reduce seed production or keep seed production below a certain threshold. So we can pull out the growing degree days that allow us to um, determine what we're calling the critical period for weed seed control um, below, in this case, a 5% seed production threshold, meaning that if we time our management practices for mid-August, um, then um, that will give us essentially the biggest bang for our buck when it comes to implementing a management practice for kochia. And the real question is, well, what do you actually implement during that time frame? Um, so I think there might be some potential for, for say, a pre-harvest herbicide, um, but also when we're thinking about those kochia patches, I think there's several different um, management practices that could be implemented just in those dense patches. And finally, I think also um, this helps us design cropping systems that target that problematic weed as well. Um, for example, 
I, I, I showed the example earlier of um, swapping out spring wheat for winter wheat, right? Harvesting winter wheat a bit earlier and cutting off those kochia plants before they produce viable seed, but after all of the kochia has emerged that is capable of producing viable seed. And so we're getting close to the end here. And so this is the, the last piece of data that I'll show, um, but what some of our other research is looking at kochia regrowth after harvest as well. Um, and you can see here, I'm showing two different site years, one of, with glyphosate resistant kochia, one with glyphosate susceptible kochia in Lethbridge. And the three different lines on the graphs are the untreated um, versus glyphosate and safufenicil applied 10 days before harvest or 10 days after harvest on the bottom here. And so if you look at these graphs, um, the x-axis is harvest date, and then the y-axis is seed production. Um, and this would be seed production on the regrowth after harvest. And you can see the untreated here producing the most amount of seed. Um, the pre-harvest application tended to reduce seed production a little bit, but the post-harvest application um, really made a lot of sense after these early harvest dates, especially if you're harvesting your crop um, in August. However, if you're going into harvest dates in September, sort of some of the typical harvest of a lot of our summer annual crops, maybe it, it, these applications actually aren't warranted when it comes to kosher management. So in summary, um, I think we all know that, that herbicide resistant kosher is a growing concern um, in the Canadian prairies, especially in the southern part of the prairies. Um, there's no silver bullet when it comes to kosher management, um, but there's a lot of tools that are effective for kosher, but I think um, our best chance is targeting those tools based on the biology and ecology of the plant and trying to target that life cycle of kosher. And finally, just based on the biology of kosher and its seed dispersal, I think that, that there's a lot of opportunity for community-based strategies where, um, for example, all farmers in a certain area commit to managing kosher effectively on their farms for a few years in a row, um, thereby preventing transfer of those plants among fields. And I think that that will also go a long way to, to helping with manage, managing this weed um, because it so easily uh, disperses its seed among multiple fields in a single year. So I referenced a lot of research um, during this presentation. And so um, here's the various references that will be available um, on the recording. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and also thank the technical staff without whom this research would not be possible. Um, I'd like to thank our various co-investigators on our broader scope of research within the program and the generous funders that, uh, that make our research possible. So thanks very much. Well, thanks, Dr. Geddes. That was a lot of great information presented, um, you know, just recapping a couple of things, the early emergence, the you know interaction between temperature and salinity, the kosha range and bioclimatic studies, the resistance update. And you know one that I thought was really interesting is just the interaction of cultural and chemical weed management, you know, because I think we got to think that way with 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 cultural practices in addition to to chemical weed management. So th thank you very much. That was a lot of great information. Uh, we're now going to open it up for questions. If you have not done so already, please type in your questions into the to the uh, question function, and I will turn it over to Rachel here to field uh, the questions that we have uh, that have come in. All right, so we've got uh, six questions from the audience, Charles. Um, I'll just ask them in order that they uh, they came in. So starting at the beginning of the presentation, um, there's a question about: uh, Is there a genetic component to kosha emergence? Yeah, I think it's it's a tough one to answer, but I can um, link it back to um, herbicide resistance traits anyway. Um, so we we know that kosher emergence for, from various kosher populations differs, right? And uh, there's there is research out there to show that in some cases it could be linked to herbicide resistance, whether it's a fitness penalty related to that resistance trait or just that population adapting to our management practices over time. That's still kind of a gray area, I think. Um, but there, there certainly is research showing that, for example, glyphosate-resistant kosher populations, many of them tend to 
emerge later, um, a few days, you could say, later um, than glyphosate susceptible populations. However, this isn't consistent across all of the populations, right? So um, we do see to, tend to see that later emergence in some of the resistant populations, which could be a mechanism to help them avoid um, that pre-emergence herbicide application. So right. there is some sort of a, a genetic component in there, but it's not completely elucidated what, what is actually causing it. Right, right. Um, that's very interesting. Yeah, kosha. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> adapting to everything that we do, it seems like. Um, so the next question is around the, the um, slides that you were showing on growing degree days. And so the um, question is just uh, which base was used for the growing degree days assessment? Yeah, so, so for kosher, we, we always use a, a temperature base of zero degrees Celsius. And the reason for that is because kosher seed can germinate very close to zero degrees Celsius. Um, so um, throughout the literature, you'll see that same ba base temperature always used as, as sort of a biological limit for kosher growth and development. Great. Um, so then moving into, uh, I think, around some of the slides you were showing on herbicide resistance and, um, and the group four uh, resistance um, that you've documented in kosher population. So the question is, what do you think about adding 2,4-D to dicamba to improve control of kosher? Yeah, I think um, that's, it's a difficult question, actually. Um, so there, there have been um, some reports of, of interaction between um, adding different um, different active ingredients together, even with their, when they're within the same mode of action. And this interaction, um, I'm, I'm referring specifically to herbicide resistance as well. Um, so, I mean, the if you're talking about 2,4-D alone, first of all, um, you see a, a very wide variability among kosher populations in response to 2,4-D. And with dicamba resistance, we're seeing um, also a very wide variability to dicamba, right? Um, but putting the two together um, does hold some potential, right? And uh, because these two different active ingredients are actually from different chemical classes within the synthetic auxin mode of action. Um, so it's possible that you could see a bit of an additive effect by mixing those two together, um, even when you're dealing with an auxinic resistant population. Right, right. I guess similar in how we think about wild oats in some cases. Yep. Um, and so moving into the next question, so this is kind of getting into the patch management um, discussions that uh, you were you were leading us through. How does salinity ratings of fields impact the efficacy of group 14 products for kosher management? Yeah, I think that that's kind of a tough one to answer and it's not um, it's not necessarily my area of research, so I, I think I'm going to uh, I'm going to shy away from giving any specific response on on the impact um, on herbicide efficacy. That's fair enough. Um, and then the last one here from the audience that I have, I believe. Um, oh no, there are so many questions that have come in actually since we've been <laughs> going through this. Um, so if we don't get to them all, folks, we'll make sure that. Um, that we uh, connect to you with Charles and we'll get your questions answered. But um, the next question that I have here on the list is, um, would there be any potential, even with glyphosate resistant kochia, to affect the seed viability with a glyphosate application? I think um, there, there potentially, I mean, just thinking about through the biology, right? I think that uh, so so co or glyphosate first of all translocates um, to essentially the actively growing part of the plant, right? So um, so if you think similar, um, glyphosate sort of translocating to to seed when we're when we're using it as a pre-harvest application. If it's applied too early, it'll translocate into that seed, creating um, creating glyphosate residues in in seed products, right? Um, but similarly, the, the same thing would be happening with kochia. Whether that actually impacts viability of those kochia seeds, um, I, based on, on my observations from that study where we're looking at um, pre-harvest glyphosate and saflufenicil um, to decrease um, kochia seed viability, we're seeing 
may be a bit of an effect, but it, it's, I, I would say at this point, there's not enough information to say that it's biologically significant. Um, so at this point, it's not necessarily a management practice that, that I would recommend. Right, right. So I think um, just to kind of wrap things up here, I'll ask one more question. Um, and then, uh, like I said, the remainder, we'll, we'll make sure that we connect uh, to get your questions answered. So last one here is, um, so is the August 5th to August 24th window for management based on Lethbridge? And if it is, what would you suggest for further north? Yeah, so, so great question. And, and yes, so, so what we did there was we linked it back to 30-year um, climactic normals for Lethbridge, right? So um, the research was done in Lethbridge and we linked it back to climatic normals for Lethbridge. So that window will, will vary somewhat depending on the conditions that, that you've seen during the growing season, mostly related to temperature, right? So um, if we're thinking of, of warmer temperatures, it will certainly shift that, um, shift that period for seed production a, a little earlier in the season, right? Um, whereas cooler temperatures will shift it a bit later. So we're expecting as that moves further north, we'll actually see, um, see that, that period maybe shift a little bit later, right? Um, at this point, we don't have the data to show that, but I can say that we're looking at, at um, some of our new research that just started in 2021 is looking at that critical period for seed control. So answering those two questions, how late can it emerge and produce viable seed before the end of the year? And also when does the seed on the plant become viable? Um, but we're looking at that in a range of sites across, across Western Canada. So we'll be able to more accurately tell how spatially variable is that sort of period um, that we're seeing um, for kochia. And we're also doing this for um, six other common weed species across the prairies as well. well. That's fabulous. That's great to get a sense of where you're going with your research and, and what we can expect um, from your lab uh, in, the, in the years to come. Yeah, for sure. Excellent. Well, thanks, Dr. Geddes. Thanks, uh, Rachel. Um, this draws, uh, brings, I guess, our class to a close and draws an end to our question period. We will get several questions uh, have come in and we will get those uh, uh, to Dr. Geddes and get you a response back. Thank you for your attendance of the Let's Talk Kosha webinar and special thanks to Dr. Charles Geddes for being our guest lecturer here today. Um, as men already mentioned, the link to today's class will be uh, emailed out to you shortly. Thank you all for your attendance and have a great uh, day. All right. Thanks for attending.